this lecture, I'm going to take you through education and social policy. Now, I've broken this down into two parts because it's quite a chunky element of the specification um, and it can be a little bit overwhelming if it's all done in one go. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at the main aims of education policy in the UK and see if the policies that were introduced that you researched um, before this lesson achieved those aims or whether they were too broad or just generally didn't quite do what they set out to do. Maybe they, they aimed to do it, but the actual impact that they had didn't meet those aims. So your task as always is to use the video or the audio, whichever one you're, you're listening to, to take your notes and use the notes grid in your ISB to support your um, note taking, to give you some structure to that note taking. Now, as I said, there, there are four aims to education and um, policy. You've got raising standards, marketization of education, educational equality and economic efficiency. Now, in the first part of this lecture, so uh, I'm going to deal with raising standards and marketization. In the second part, I will be looking at educational um, equality and economic efficiency. Okay, so part one, raising standards in education and marketization. Part two, educational equality and economic efficiency. So we'll start with raising standards. So what does that actually mean? So when we're looking at raising standards as a policy aim, it can be broken down into three parts. Now, but in general, what it is saying is it's about making education better. It's ways of improving the education system to make it better. And the first way that we look at doing that is privatization in education. Now, this isn't about making more private schools or turning state schools into private schools. What it's looking at is changing the internal process of the education system so that it mirrors a business it more. So it's using the internal processes and trying to make them to be more like a private business. You've then also got privatization of education. And again, this is not about making more private schools or turning state schools into private schools. It's about bringing um, private businesses into schools to support their daily running. So this could be the catering staff, it could be the estates or um, caretaking staff, it could be finance management, um, teacher training, uh, external agencies to deliver part of the curriculum. All of these things would be considered privatisation of education, but within the state school. And then you've also got quality control policies to ensure that all schools are providing the best possible education to their pupils. So the, the DfE, the government, making sure that schools are doing what they're meant to be doing. They're, they're covering, they're doing their jobs. They're doing that they're fulfilling their role. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the policies that have been introduced by the Conservatives with the with the purpose of raising standards in education. And some of those will link just to the general area of raising standards of, of making education better, but others will link more towards one of those three elements. And we're gonna look at what they are. So we're gonna start with the Conservatives from 1979 to 1997. So this is Margaret Thatcher and John Major. And they introduced one of the biggest education policies um, in our history, and that's the Education Reform Act of 1988. And this had a huge impact on education system and introduced a number of policies and changes to what teachers were doing in the classroom. The first one they introduced that was really important was Ofsted. And Ofsted is the inspectorate of schools, of state schools, private schools and independent schools. They have their own version of this, 
but Ofsted is a supposedly neutral agency that goes into schools to ensure that they are providing the best education possible. So you could say that this is a quality control policy, but it also could be considered privatisation of education because it's moving um, the inspector away from schools and to an external body. And what Ofsted does is it comes in it and, and it looks at data, it looks at the running of the schools, it might observe some lessons um, to see what it is that schools are doing and if they are providing the best education possible for their students. Now, whether or not they actually achieve that, there's a lot of people who would argue that perhaps Ofsted is no longer fit for purpose um, is debatable. Um, part of the reason for that is schools will change what they do, not because it's better for their children or for their students, but it's because Ofsted want it. So Ofsted might say, we really like this type of lesson or this type of programme. And then schools go, right, we've got to change everything to be what Ofsted want it to be so that we can get that outstanding, regardless of whether that's the best thing for the students that they teach. They also introduced the national curriculum. So prior to 1988, schools could pretty much teach whatever they wanted, unless you were an exam subject, in which case you kind of covered the specification. But the national curriculum runs from key stage one and early years all the way through to the end of key stage three. Um, there is a key stage four national curriculum, which states that uh, certain subjects still need to be taught at, GC at uh, key stage four, even if they're not GCSE subjects. Um, and what needs to be covered in them, for example, PSHE. So the national curriculum is about quality control of education because what it's doing is it's telling schools this is the minimum requirement. You can do more than that, but this is the minimum that we require you to do to provide an education to children, to, to students of the UK. So it outlined topics, skills, areas of study that schools needed to cover it within each key stage or each year group. Now, the first iteration of the national curriculum was quite prescriptive. You studied this topic in this year and this topic in this year and this topic in this year. Since then, there have been multiple reforms and multiple changes to the education, to the national curriculum. And it's made and it's become more um, flexible and it's become looser in terms of allowing schools the opportunity to shape their curriculum to meet the needs of their students while still meeting the requirements of the national curriculum. So here we're really seeing that quality control of education by providing that minimum requirement. They also introduced national testing. Now this is what you might re remember as being called SATs and they are end of key stage tests. When it was introduced in 1988, it was end of key stage two, so year six, and end of key stage three, year nine. Now the year nine SATs went away quite a while ago now. I think my year group was probably one of the last year groups to do it, but the key stage two SATs still stand. And the national testing wasn't about individual students. It was a performance management and performance target test for the government to see how schools were doing. So that would be privatisation in education, as well as quality control, because it could see if schools weren't um, making progress with their students, if the students were falling behind or doing badly in the national test, maybe there was a problem and maybe there was an issue with that school. But the national testing was about performance management of schools, not performance management of students. You don't put your key stage two SATS results on your CV. Um, it really is just an internal assessment, really. And that's why a lot of people are now calling for the A6 SATS to be scrapped because th they don't mean anything. Most secondary schools now do their own baseline testing in year seven. Um, 
parents are opting out of the year six sats they're not um mandatory parents can opt out of the for their children not to do them so they're not really act doing what they were intended to do anymore so there is a call now for those sats to be scrapped if we move on now to new labor now in terms of raise, this is a general raising standards um policy the maximum class sizes now unfortunately maximum class size is only applied to five to seven year olds and the maximum class size was 25. obviously this has now gone out the window i know many primary school teachers with classes of 30 or above um obviously we're in a class of over 30. um there are subjects that do still have maximum class sizes for health and safety reasons practical science pe technology those classes need to have smaller numbers because of health and safety and that's not a um, educational reason that is pure safety reasons um, but new labor introduced the maximum class sizes to increase the ratio or sorry to decrease the ratio of students to teachers so that there were less students per teacher um, and this was so that the teacher could give more individualized learning which would improve standards now this policy has actually been scrapped now by the coalition government the conservative and the conservative government but it the idea behind it was to raise standards by having smaller class sizes similar to the sizes of classes you would see in a private or independent school and that meant that there was more individualized learning there was more individualized support rather than um, students to and also to prevent students falling through the, the cracks if you like new labor also introduced building schools for the future um, and this is a mixture of raising standards but also privatization um, of education building schools for the future program was a way to improve school facilities to ensure that roofs didn't leak and heating systems worked and to build new buildings that were far more suitable to modern education and it, if you've got good buildings you can focus on the learning not necessarily on the fact that you're freezing or there's a leak or any of those other things that could be happening and it's privatization of education because not only did schools have to bid to the dfe to get the funding building companies had to bid to the dfe to get the contracts schools didn't find their own contractors they were given a contractor by the department for education so schools didn't actually receive the funding at all they would create the plans and and the proposal put it into the dfe as part of the building schools for the future program the dfe would either say yes or no if they said yes building firms and contractors would then bid for that contract through the department for education now the conservative government again has got rid of this program they said it was too expensive and unnecessary um, and it's gone back to planning permissions and schools finding their own contractors eazs or education action zones now this was again a raising standards in general policy because what an education action zone was was it was a an area of deprivation where there were high levels of poverty free school meals refugee children um, and um, what it did was it provided additional funding to those areas to support learning so it would be um, money for resources or for more teachers or more highly um, sought after teachers to convince them to so they would pay these teachers more to go and work in these deprived schools now again this policy didn't survive outside of new labor um, because it was expensive um, and but it did help to raise standards in some respects because it did provide children from um, deprived backgrounds with the resources necessary to improve their education to be able to access their education 
more fully. New Labour also introduced what they called business sponsored academies. And these were schools who would be, they would still be state schools, but they would have additional funding provided by an external company. Now this again can be seen as privatization of education as well as um, raising standards in general because more money, better resources, better education. Now this policy on the surface sounds great and there are some really big companies such as Google and Apple who do sponsor schools and provide equipment and financing and resources for those schools. Um, for example, in an Apple sponsored school, everything was done on iPads and they would use the Apple um, operating system for all of their schools. Um, they'd use Macs um, instead of PCs. Teachers would be provided with a Mac, um, which would then project onto the screen and things like that. And that's brilliant and that's great. And Google did um, similar things. However, when we start hitting a recession and these businesses not we're not talking the multinationals now but the, the other businesses that were sponsoring these schools were fa facing financial hardship one of the first things they stopped doing was sponsoring the school and that school would then lose that funding they would still be funded by the dfe but their funding would be cut by not having that additional income from the from the um business so it did work in some respects, but it wasn't a necessarily a long term plan. So if we move on then to the coalition government, they introduced pupil premium and pupil premium is um, a process where um, you would, if you were from a deprived background, so if you were free school meals, if you were um, a forces child or so your parents were in the armed forces, um, if you were a looked after child, so you're in foster care or going through adoption, or if you were previously a looked after child, then you would be considered pupil premium. Um, and that would be would then provide additional funding for you to the school. So it wasn't a case of the student would get the money. The money would all go to a central pot in the school. So the students who were, were identified as pupil premium could then, um, teachers could then ask for resources to be purchased for those children from that fund. So it could be revision guides, textbooks, um, things like that. So pupil premium was about raising educational standards in general, in, but in particular for students who were from deprived backgrounds. And that's still available today. They also introduced the English Baccalaureate, and this was one of Michael Gove's um, flagship policies. Uh, and what the English Baccalaureate did was it was trying to emulate the International Baccalaureate by saying that in order to achieve the EBAC, you needed to have studied certain subjects at GCSE. And that was English, Maths, A Science, which also included PE at GCSE level um, and uh, Computer Science, a Humanities, a Language, um, and two uh, other subjects, hang on. Yeah, two, and then three other subjects at GCSE. So it was an eight subject um, baccalaureate. Um, and the idea was to not necessarily narrow the curriculum, although that's what it did. It was to give a broader, the idea was it was to give a broader curriculum to make sure that students got, took a broad, number of subjects at GCSE level. But you'll notice that on that list, you didn't have any of the arts subjects, no music, no drama, no art, so no technology subjects, unless you count uh, computer science. So it, instead of broadening it, making sure students had a broader number of subjects at GCSE, it actually narrowed it down. And 
Um, obviously, a lot of schools also do English, both Lit and Lang. So that would take up two, two subjects on the baccalaureate. It also introduced the changing of grading from A to G to 1 to 9, which confused a lot of people at the time. I was like, OK, what does that mean? Um, especially the le grade 9, because a grade 9 was determined by the top 10 percent of the country or of all the students that took that um, subject at GCSE and in that um, exam board. So um, to get a level nine, you had to be in the top 10 percent of the country. And of course, as schools, we couldn't then target people or we shouldn't be targeting people nines because we don't know what the rest of the country are doing. Um, so the EBAC was about raising standards and quality control because it was trying to make sure that students didn't narrow too much at GCSE level. Going along with that, uh, Michael Gove reformed the examination um, structure. So prior to the um, under new labour, you had modular exams. So you would do some of your GCSE uh, modules at the end of year 10 and the rest at the end of year 11. Um, and you can resit them if you didn't do very well. And the same for A level, you would do um, a January exam in year 12, you do a January and a June exam and the same again in year 13. And it was cumulative. So those grades would combine together to um, create your final grade. Now, the, it then changed to um, ASA2 at A level. So you did end of year 12 exams, which were 50 percent of your grade and then a your A level exams at the end of year 13 and to make up the other 50 percent of your grade. Now, the reason Michael Gove wanted to get rid of these this system was it was easy to manipulate and game because what we he, what we found was there were certain students who would sit certain, some of the exams four times and it would be the best grade that they achieved that would be added to their final grade and this really disadvantaged working class students because they couldn't afford those resets. So they would only get one crack at it. Um, whereas some middle class and upper class students would perhaps have three or four chances at getting the best grade possible. So Michael Gove said he wanted to make the exams more rigorous and he wanted to make them um, more difficult because he said they were too easy. So what he did is he introduced the linear exams, meaning that you only sit your GCSEs at the end of year 11 and you only sit your A-levels at the end of year 13. And the AS exam is a completely separate exam that is a one year course. Now, for some, that was a, a good thing. For others, not so much. But it, the purpose of it was to stop the gaming of the system and um, in some respects, it did do that, but it putting all your eggs in one basket, as we've seen in recent times, has made it more difficult um, for students. We also saw reform of the national curriculum, and, and this was again about raising standards overall. So the prescriptive nature of the national curriculum was reviewed. And the, in the reform, it gave schools more opportunity to shape the curriculum to the needs of their students so that their students would get the best education possible that fit their context. Now there were still the baselines in terms of um, what needed to be taught but instead of being year by year it was more key stage. So in key stage three history you need to cover these things, in key stage three RE you need to cover these things but how you do that is up to your individual school to shape your curriculum to meet the needs of your students. And then you've got the performance targets for schools. Um, so this increased from the uh, national testing that we had in uh, 1988. And this is privatisation in education because it's, it's putting business practices into schools by creating these performance targets. So it introduced what was called value added. 
And this was a measurement to see how much um, value schools had added to children's education. So what they would do is they would take their prior attainment, so key stage two SATs or baseline assessments at the beginning of year seven, and um, then see what the average GCSE score was for students who had the same um, entry level as the students in your school. And it would all be averaged out. So if you if your students achieved more than the national average, you had a positive score and that was a good thing. If your students didn't achieve as much as the national average, you got a negative score, which is a bad thing. If you got a zero score, that meant your students achieved what they were meant to do. Now, this kind of sounds like a good way of making sure that schools are providing the best education possible and to monitor the education that students are providing. Now, one of the problems with value added is if you've got a high achieving year group come in with lots of high targets. So if your your tar your year group has a lot of, say, sevens or eights in their targets for GCSEs or A's or A stars at A level, then you can't get a high positive score because you can't get higher than the top grade. So it means that some schools might have a neutral value added because they had a high intake, high level intake. OK. And also what it meant was that schools started teaching to the test because it was all based on test scores. So rather than providing a broad and balanced curriculum that shaped the entire child, you're focusing solely on how to get the best grade possible because you want to get your higher up, higher value added. Now, the conservative governments from 2015 to, that we cu and currently have have obviously had some big issues going on. So education has kind of taken a little bit of a backseat. Um, not that they haven't done anything. They have like the independent schools sponsored academies where private schools would provide additional funding, resources, training and facilities to academies to support their students. And it was kind of it was put forward as a way of independent schools giving back to the community. Um, and what we saw was these independent schools were would pr would allow um, their academy sponsor their sponsored academies to use their sporting facilities or to they'd have a teacher come in to do Latin club or classics club or things like that um, and provide opportunities that perhaps those students wouldn't get elsewhere. So again, this is seeing privatization of education because independent schools are private enterprises. They are not state run. But it's also about raising standards by giving those students in those academies more opportunities for different um, experiences, but access as well to better facilities and resources. They also expanded the grammar school program. So obviously grammar schools still exist, even though the tripartite system has ended and you still need to do the 11 plus to get into them. But the um, 11 plus is no longer mandatory and you only do it if you are applying to send your child or your child only does it if you're applying to send them to a grammar school. But the Conservative government wanted to expand the number of grammar schools available and have other schools that weren't grammar schools to become grammar schools as they saw that these sort of schools provided a more academic education and um, were good opportunities for the more able students to receive that more academic education. It's almost like providing the uh, going back to the tripartite system, but in a kind of backdoor kind of way. But again, it's about raising standards by providing that more academic um, education for the more able students. And they have also reformed Ofsted. So um, instead of Ofsted looking at your data, and kind of going, well, you've got high value added, you've got good GCSE scores, 
um, you've got low exclusions, you must be a good school. Fantastic, off you go. Um, what they wanted was Ofsted to focus more on curriculum and they introduced the three I's, intent, implementation and impact. So they wanted to see what schools intended for their curriculum to do, how they've implemented that curriculum and what the impact of that curriculum has been. And that has kind of filtered down to different subjects. So the subjects now have to do their intent statements, their implementation um, processes and their impact statements when Ofsted come in. Um, and again, it's about raising standards. It's about making sure that schools know why they're doing what they're doing and what the impact of what they're doing is. They're not just doing it for the sake of it. They're actually reflecting on the education system that they're, or the education that they're providing to ensure that you, they are giving the best education possible. So when we're looking at raising standards, we can see that a lot of these policies on the surface do aim to improve standards. They're, they're there to, to make education better. Whether or not they, they have actually achieved that, that's for you to decide. You need to evaluate whether or not they have done a good job in raising standards or whether they've perhaps the latent functions, the, the side, side effects of these policies have actually been more detrimental to the education system than they have been positive. But that's up to you to decide. The next policy aim we're going to look at is marketization policies. And again, this can be broken down into three parts, but essentially marketization is about creating a marketplace for education. So it's about creating a sense of competition within schools or, or between schools. Um, but what they wanted to do, what the purposes of the policies were, were to create more independence for schools, to give schools more choice over how they operate and what they offer the students that attend their school. The, and competition between schools for students. And this is linked to the raising standards to a certain degree, because if schools have to compete for the students that attend, then they need to raise the standards. They need, they need to provide the best education possible if they want to get the students into their school. So it was, a link, it was kind of creating that competition to raise standards. And finally, they wanted to create more parental choice. So give parents more choice over the type of school they send their child to, but also um, the type of education their child receives. So let's look at the um, different government policies that have kind of brought in these marketization aims to the education system. Now, this was a big thing for the Conservatives between 79 and 97 and has a very much strong link to the new right and new right theories of education in that they believe that education requires more competition if we're going to raise standards. And one of the first things that the Conservatives introduced was league tables. And you've probably heard about league tables and, and have seen them around. It's a way of ranking schools. And it can be based on Ofsted rankings. It can be based on GCSE scores, A-level scores. Um, but a way, and it can be done locally, it can be done nationally. It's done internationally as well with the PISA rankings. But what we're seeing is that this introduction of league tables creates greater competition between schools because they want to be at the top of the league table. They want to be high up in the league table. We're the best school in the area. And the reason they want to be at the top is they want to attract students. And that creates the parentocracy, the, the parental choice, because what it does is uh, these league tables are uh, published in national newspapers. They're available on the DFE website, um, the local authority website, so that parents can see what the best schools in the area are for their children. 
and then apply to send those children to those schools. And that links into the next policy they brought in, which was the funding formula. And this is how they work out school budgets. So we, every school gets a certain amount of money per student per year. And it's always done in arrears. So the budget we have for this year, for academic year 2021, is actually based on the number of students we had in academic year 2019-2020. And that's because um, it's around October, November time when the school completes its census. So that, that's a document that tells the DfE how many students are enrolled in the school and uh, information about those students, whether they're people premium, um, whether they're looked after or previously looked after children, whether they're SEND, all of those things are put onto the census. The government or the DfE then use an algorithm, which we know works so well, um, to work out how much money that school will receive and it get and it's usually around May June time when that money is actually received which is why because that's the end of the school year our budgets run in arrears okay but schools have to compete for students because if they don't have a lot of students they're not going to get a lot of funding so they need to be able to attract um, students to the school because bums on seats mean money in the bank and that means we can buy resources and get teachers and and things like that so the funding formula was a way to create competition um, between schools for students you then got open enrollment and this one really focuses in on parentocracy which is another way of saying parental choice so Prior to 1979, no, 1988, because this was part of the Education Reform Act, you just sent your child to the to the local school. If you whatever school was in your catchment area, that was the school that you sent your child to. Now, open enrolment meant that you could actually apply to send your child to any school you liked, as long as you could get them there. So even if they were in another county or if they were in another borough in London, for example, or outside of your catchment area, you could send you could apply to send your child there. And um, then if that school has is undersubscribed, i.e. it has space, your child can go there. If it's an oversubscribed school, then there is a process to determine whether or not your child would get a space. And the process goes like this. So all the applications go into the local authority because it is the local authority that determines what where the schools go. It's not individual schools. They don't go through the application process, go, yeah, we want that one. Yeah, no, we don't want that one. It is done at a local authority level. And what they do is they, first of all, identify the students who are looked after children. So these are children who are in foster care or adoption or children's homes, things like that. And they get their first choice of school. So they will go to their first choice school. Whatever spaces you then have left, which is usually quite a lot by this point, it goes to special educational needs and pupil premium students. So it's then worked out what where these students want to go and they are distributed to to the schools that they want to go to next it then starts getting a little bit complicated because um the next level is siblings so if you already have a child at the school in some local authorities usually more rural ones where there's a there's less schools in the same area they have the sibling rule which means that if you have another child that at that school already then your younger children can also go to that school. However, in school, in areas where there are a lot of schools within a small area, particularly bigger cities, London, Birmingham, places like that, they may not have the sibling rule. They may say, no, we're, we're not. It doesn't matter whether you've got a child in one school or another. You, they're, they're close enough. You can get them to it to the different schools. Um, so areas like Norfolk still employ the sibling rule. After the sibling rule, it then goes to catchment area. And what they do is they work out what, how many spaces you then have left and using another algorithm, they work out what your catchment area is. 
So they, they work out a radius of children within that radius will go to your school if they in, depending on how much space you have. Now, that can be quite a small catchment area, but it has levels. So if you still got spaces after the, the initial catchment area, it then goes to the next level and the next level and the next level. So to give you an example, a couple of years ago, the um, Wyndham College catchment area was a third of a mile. Now, there are no houses within a third of a mile radius of the, of the college. Um, and it, it's done from the uh, main reception point. So at this point, the main reception was where the metal stairs are, so quite central to campus. And there are no houses within a third of a mile of that. So it then went to the next le level and there were still no houses. So the next level, the next level, um, until all the spaces are filled. Now, the idea behind per open enrollment was that parents would have more choice about where they sent their children to school. However, because of open enrollment, there has become a, pro a kind of covert selection process as, as suggested by Tuff and Brooks. And this is ways that schools kind of backhandedly and or probably not really consciously um, focus in on the type of students they want for their school. So, for example, they may have high uniform costs in order to attract more middle class students rather than working class students. They may have um, requirements such as letters from your um, priest or your religious leader, if it's a religious school, in order to get your child into the school. So there, there are ways that schools can covertly select who they want to come to school before the before the parents even apply. You another way is using um, high level language where some parents may look at and go, well, I haven't got a clue what they're talking about. I can't send my child there or um, ad only advertising in certain areas and not others. So the the idea of open enrollment does create competition in schools because it's a way of giving parents more choice about where they send their school, where, where they send their child. You then also got Ofsted, and this really did create competition within schools because Ofsted gives schools ratings. Now, in 1988, when it was first established, the ratings were outstanding, good, satisfactory, um, special measures. That's now changed. And literally all they've done is change the language. So it's outstanding, good, requires improvement, special measures. And what schools would do is that they would need, they would want to have that outstanding label because then they could put it on banners all over the school and kind of go uh, all over the place and kind of go, we're an outstanding school, send your child here. Yeah. So it's creating competition between schools for um, that outstanding banner. Now in 1987, uh, sorry, 1997, when New Labour came into power, they didn't get rid of any of these things. We still have league tables, the funding formula, open enrollment and Ofsted. But what they also introduced was the idea of specialist schools. And this created competition between schools for this specialist school um, title. And what a specialist school was, was a school who had a particularly good department in a particular subject. So maybe it was PE or music or art or technology or maths or science, um, IT. Um, and schools would apply for that specialist school's title. But you couldn't have two schools in a, in a certain geographical area with the same specialist school label or title. So, for example, Wyndham College gets the languages uh, specialist school title. That means that for the next three or four years, Attleborough and Wyndham High can't apply to be a language school. When the time is up, they can then apply and they could probably take they could take that title from Wyndham College. But whilst Wyndham College holds that title, no other school within a ge certain geographical area 
and there isn't a specific geographical area because it depends on where you are in the country, could have that title. So it created competition between schools, but it also gave parents more choice as well because it gave them more information about that school. If they wanted their child to go to a school that special, had specialist language status or PE status or technology status, they would look for those specialist school titles. Business Sponsors Academies created more independence with schools. So by being an academy, it lessened the control of the local authority. And by having businesses involved, it created independence on how your, you, your school was structured, the infrastructure of it, what resources you had available and used. So, for example, Apple schools would ha be an iOS school. They, they would use iPads and Macs and um, Apple technology, whereas a Google school would, would use Google. There'd, there'd be Google Classroom and, and things like that. So um, or Chromebooks and things. So business sponsored academies created more independence for schools to be able to shape the school the way that they wanted them. Under the coalition, Michael Gove also introduced what he called free schools. Now, that didn't mean that they were free of charge, that all school, all state schools are free of charge. What the free element meant was that schools were free of local authority control. So they weren't um, dictated to by the local authority. They could shape their curriculum how they wanted. And there were certain educational policies that they then didn't have to follow. But um, also what it meant was that charities, businesses, parents could all apply to open a free school. So, for example, Jane Austen in Norwich. Um, and but they could only be opened in an area where there were a lack of places for um, students. So there weren't enough school places in that area for the number of children who needed to go to school in that area. But it created independence in the sense that those free schools can run how they see fit. They had more freedom to shape their school, to shape their curriculum and their process, roles and processes, how they thought was best for their students. Also creates more competition because more, more schools, more competition between schools and gave parents more choice about where they wanted to send their children to school. Then by this point, the coalition government had got rid of business sponsored academies and created what they called new style academies. And this includes multi academy trusts, just like the one that Wyndham College belongs to, the Sepienta Trust. And what these multi academy trusts did was kind of group schools together um, under a, an umbrella leadership to raise standards and to um, kind of pool resources, if you like. So in some of the bigger um, academies like Inspiration Trust, um, they would say that once you're you are not employed by your individual school, you are employed by the trust. So if we need you to move to another school, you move to another school. Now, our trust doesn't do that. Sepienta doesn't do that. But um, it, it gave those those schools more independence within the schools within the trust, more independence about how they ran their schools, their policies, their um, ideas, um, their curriculum. They had more freedom because the new style academies were also freer from local authority dictation. Um, they still had to follow certain local authority rules and they still have to follow educational policy, but they, they have more freedom to choose. And again, it creates competition because it's new types of schools and parental choice. Now, the 27, the current Conservative government haven't really done much in terms of marketization. They've just kind of carried on from the coalition. But we can see marketization within the, the current situation with the remote teaching. And in what I mean by that is different schools are using different platforms. So we're a 365 school, so we're using Microsoft Teams. Some schools are just using Zoom, some are using Google Classroom, some are using Show My Homework. So 
it's the remote teaching the way the government has promoted remote teaching gives schools much more independence about how they are approaching their remote learning and also freedom on how they do it so in some schools it's 100 percent live every lesson live all the time every single lesson some schools have gone for a more blended approach where it's partly live partly video others have gone for um, a completely non-screen way of doing things so the, 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 the remote teaching policies that are coming from the DfE allow schools the independence to shape their remote teaching to the context of their students so so that brings us to the end of the first part of the education and social policy lecture. So we've covered marketization and we've covered ra raising standards. And we've looked at some of the policies that governments introduced to achieve those aims. Now, whether or not you believe that those policies did that or not, that is up to you. And you need to weigh up whether or not you feel that the, the intended aim was achieved or whether perhaps it didn't quite hit the mark. In the next lecture, which will be which you'll look at in the next lesson, we'll look at um, economic equality, um, economic efficiency and equality of education as the other two aims of social policy. But again, it will be very similar in the sense of we'll look at what they mean and which policies were uh, implemented to achieve those aims. So for now, just focus on the two that we've looked at. Make sure you've got your notes up to date on them.